Hello and welcome to this video in which we're going to be looking at the actual results of the mixed methods ANOVA um, and interpreting them and then we're going to come back to um, our two hypotheses here and, and think about whether the um, uh, findings provide any support for that or, or not. So if we come back to our SPSS output file um, there is a Word version uh, of this file available on Blackboard as well. Um, so if you can't open, if you haven't got SPSS on your device at home, um, you can still open um, the file in, in the Word document uh, and access it. Um, it. The formatting will look a bit different um, because of how it's exported to Word, but the uh, contents will be the same. Okay, so the thing we're interested in now, we've had a look at all of our assumption checking to start with. Uh, so we know that um, we have mm -hmm. got some issues, um, particularly around the Levine's test of quality of error variances, that we're going to have to adjust for when we're interpreting our output. Um, but the bulk of the output then um, that we're interested in now is under the t this title general linear model um, and we know that ANOVA uh, regression and man manover all kind of part of this general linear model. Okay, so the first box um, is called the within subjects factor and what we're going to double check is that we've um, set up our repeated measures um, independent variable in the in in a way that we, we understand. So we've got in our first level of goal type is the materialistic, attain, uh, materialistic goals and the second goal type here, number two, um, is the non-materialistic. So we've got to remember that when we're interpreting our output and that's because of the way that our data set is set up and um, our uh, the way we ran the analysis we had to tell SPSS what our within subjects measure was um, uh, and so that's what we've labeled it as. Within the in the between subjects factor box here, um, that was already set up really for us. Um, so we just want to make sure we've chosen the right variable. If we're having a look to start with, um, it might be useful just to have a um, a look at the means uh, for each of the uh, the gender groups for each of our uh, levels of um, goal type um, on on attainment. Mm -hmm. So this can be useful just to get a sense of the the patterns. Um, so we've got um, uh, males in the material on materialistic goals um, scoring 2.8 and females scoring 2.8 uh, if you round it up. So they're, they're scoring very uh, to a very similar degree on materialistic goals. But let's have a look at the non-materialistic goals. Um, so what we've got here are males are scoring 5.5, women are scoring 6.1. So we can see there's a bit of a jump between the genders on non-materialistic goals. Um, if we look at overall ignoring um, gender, then we see that overall um, students are rating their materialistic aspiration scores as 2.8. And if we compare that overall, ignoring gender, we can see that on non-materialistic aspirations, they're, they're scoring at much higher, um, so 5.8. Um, so we can see that maybe overall there is a difference in attainment for different kinds of goals. Um, what we'd like to look at now is, is there a difference between males and females on attainment scores if we ignore the type of goal we're asking them about? Um, so we have to find um, that somewhere else in our output. Um, and that would be in the estimated marginal mean. So we just, just let's move to that bit of the output first. Okay, so we've got to pick through this to, to understand what's going on. Um, the grand mean is just where we've looked at attainment ratings, ignoring goal type and ignoring gender. What's the average for the whole sample just on attainment? Um, and we can see that, that it's 4.3. Okay, so that's, that in itself isn't too useful in this example. Um, but what we are interested in is this estimate here. What we can see is that between males and females, the means on these uh, scores, if we ignore the type of goal, we just look at the degree um, to which someone perceives that they've attained their goals, regardless of what type, what we can see is that males are scoring 4.1 and females are scoring 4.4, so very similar um, to each other there. So what this suggests is if we're just looking at the descriptive statistics that we, we're probably going to see a, a difference in uh, amount of attainment dependent on goal type, mm -hmm. possibly not on dependent on gender, but there may be an interaction between the two. 
um, just because of the patterns and the means. So what we've got to do now is to actually look at whether that is um, these patterns appear to be statistically significant um, or not. Okay, so then, so we, the first box we're going to look at is the within subjects factors. So I'll just come back up to here. Sorry, the test of within subjects effects. So I'll just come to this box here. Uh, and in this um, table, you'll see um, three different sections. Um, so this is the main effect of goal type. So that's whether there's, um, for students ignoring their gender, is there a difference between um, uh, on attainment based on whether it's non-materialistic or materialistic goals? This is actually the interaction between the two independent variables. So is there a difference in attainment between the different types of goals? Is that affected by whether you're male or female? Is there something else going on? So is the difference between these two goal types, uh, the attainment on these two goal types, different if you're male or female? And actually what we're talking about here is a moderation effect. Um, so this is one of the older ways of doing uh, moderation analysis, for example. Um, the other piece of information we'd want to look at is in the test of between subjects effects. So I'll just flick down to there so you can see it. And the, the row we're interested in there is um, the sex variable, and this tells us whether there's a difference, regardless of the type of goal, but on perceived attainment of goals. Okay, so that's where all, all of our three effects are. We've got two uh, main effects, a main effect of um, goal type, a main effect of gender or sex, and an interaction between the two. So we've got to interpret those. So if we go back to the test of within subjects effects, You'll notice here that we have a series of, of options we can choose from. Now we know, um, because we've only got two levels of this, the repeated measures element, we can assume sericity. We don't even have to check. Um, that assumption only comes into play if you've got a repeated measures element with um, three or more levels. So we can ignore that. Um, so what it means is we can just choose the top row of test statistics and we can ignore these other three options. You would usually use um, the greenhouse geyser test statistics. If you do have a problem with sericity, that's the one you should use. Um, but we're going to use the top row of test statistics. And what you'll see here is you've got your F-ratio, and you've got your P-value, and you've got your measure of effect size, which is part partial eta squared in this example. So if we have a look um, in this column, we're looking to see if that P-value is, uh, or that significance, um, is less than 0 0.05. We can see that it is. So that's actually um, being recorded as 0 0.000. If we're reporting that, we have to say that P is less than 0 0.001. Um, so that looks like it's, it's this ob observation of patterns of findings of means um, is unlikely to have arisen if the null hypothesis that there's no uh, goal type has no impact on attainment. Um, if that's true, this is this kind of is very unusual to identify this size of difference between the two groups uh, means, sorry, the two conditions means. Um, so that is statistically significant. So then we'll come down and we'll look at the, the interaction effect. Again, we'll look at the sericity assumed test statistics. And what we can see here is that we have, uh, again, a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So that is also highly statistically significant. The next piece of information we want to look at is the partial eta squared for these. And these give us an idea of um, how impactful um, the, the finding is in terms of how useful might this be. So the significance tells us um, how likely the um, uh, effect is to have happened if the null hypothesis is true. So um, if there's really nothing going on, um, you know, or actually it looks like there's a genuine difference between um, the two, the, the ratings across goal types. The partially to square tells us how big is that difference. Would we consider this a big difference, a small difference between the means? Um, and, you know, would it be something that we'd be able to see fairly consistently across studies? Or, you know, could it be perhaps a little bit unreliable or, or just not that useful? Uh, and so partially to squared has a set of cutoffs that you can you can use to help you identify whether something represents a big difference, um, a large sized effect, medium or a small sized effect. Uh, and so we'll look at those cutoffs now. 
Okay, so this is just a, a separate slide I've, um, mm -hmm. that I've taken from the ANOVA slides um, from your um, In Between Blocks uh, lectures, um, and where we looked at different measures of effect. And what we can see is for um, uh, partially to squared, um, what we've got is a, a small effect is 0 0.01, a medium effect is 0 0.06, and a large effect would be 0 0.14. Um, so if we take that back and look at what we've actually identified in our research, so we look back at the output, we can see that is a very large, very, very large sized effect there. Okay, And even though the goal um, uh, and gender interaction term um, that drops considerably, it's still a fairly large sized effect. So this would suggest that these two findings are probably going to have some kind of practical importance, um, practical significance, um, as well as statistical significance. Um, but next we'll look at the tests of between subjects effects. Now if you remember, actually I'll just scroll up a little bit, well, when we were looking at the data assumption checks, we realized that we had violated the equality of error variances assumption for the non-materialistic um, uh, goal type data. Um, so we're going to have to do something about that when we compare between the genders. Um, and we discussed that actually what we'll do is we'll lower the threshold for identifying a statistically significant result um, when we actually look at the effect. So when we look at this test of between subjects effects, if we hadn't violated the assumption, we would use a p-value of 0 0.05 as a cutoff. So anything less than 0 0.05 would be statistically significant. So if we were using that uh, original kind of approach, we could see that actually this the difference between the males and females um, on, on attainment of goals, regardless of the type of goal, um, would be statistically significant. But we know because we violated this assumption of the equality of error variances, that finding might not be produced because there's a real difference between the means. It may be produced because this, the range of scores across the two groups essentially differ. So it could be an arbitrary difference um, that's been identified because we violated this assumption. So what we have to do is lower that p-value, uh, that threshold, uh, and we would normally lower it to 0.01. So now, if we look at the significance value, we've got 0 0.024. With our new um, lowered um, p-value threshold of 0 0.01, this is no longer statistically significant. So you'd have to talk about that as you were writing up, um, what that really means, um, and um, that, uh, that you've done this to try and control for the increased risk uh, of, of kind of making a mistake in, in interpreting statistical significance because this assumption has been violated. So it can have quite important consequences. Um, so, but it looks like now we've found um, um, a, a significant uh, difference between goal type and there is an interaction. So what do we do? Well, you'd report all of these, whether they're significant or not. But when you're actually going um, through and interpreting the findings, you should place more weight on the interaction term rather than the significant main effect of goal type. And the reason for that is that this main effect of goal type is now misleading. Actually, it's not just about the type of goal you're asking someone to, to think about. It also depends whether they're male or female as to what your attainment level will look like on that perceived attainment. So when you're writing up your results, you would focus more on the interaction term than you would on the main effect here, even though that's statistically significant, um, because you know that is contingent on another variable. Um, so that's really important when you're writing up. Um, but uh, we've had a look at the descriptive statistics earlier and what they might tell us. But one of the other ways to really understand what this interaction looks like is to look at um, a plot. Uh, and so we asked SPSS to produce some profile plots. Um, and now what I asked SPSS to produce a couple of profile plots. And I've, um, I've used in this example a bar chart. I actually find interpreting line graphs for interactions much easier, but um, I wanted to show you this way because um, sometimes some journals have a trend, they prefer bar charts rather than line graphs when you're you know, reporting. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples. Um, within this, this is displaying, um, so this example here and the second plot here, they're both displaying the same information, but I've organized them in slightly different ways. And that's because sometimes a graph is far easier to interpret when it's organized in one way than another. So in this first example, what we've got along the um, x-axis is gender, 
um, and so we've got males on the left and females on the right um, and then gold types as the different colored bars um, so we know that blue was the if we go back and check so blue represents materialistic mm -hmm. and red bars represent non-materialistic goals so we can see here that there seems to be okay there's a big jump between um, the the non uh, materialistic and non-materialistic goals for both males and females but actually the bar for the um, materialistic uh, non-materialistic goals is much higher um, for uh, for potentially females we can see there's a jump here so that would be evidence of the interaction but I think it's actually easier to see that pattern here and so this is where I've organized the graph so that goal type is the along the x-axis and this time the bars represent males and females and their mean rating scores uh, of attainment and now what we can see is um, more clearly the pattern in which mean is higher um, uh, for uh, goal type reverses for males and females. Okay, so we can see um, in uh, for uh, materialistic goals, uh, females are scoring slightly lower than males, um, uh, but for non-materialistic goals, females are scoring quite a lot more than males, respectively. Um, so if I was going to report this and I was going to include a bar chart to illustrate this interaction, um, then I would use this version because I think it displays that, that reversal in the patterns between the genders more clearly th than this one. But that's a decision you have to make. Okay. So hopefully that's given you an idea of interpreting the mixed methods ANOVA findings. Have another look at it, go back through it. If there are things you're not sure about, revisit your um, ANOVA lecture to see if um, you want to learn a bit more about things like your F-ratio and how it's calculated. Um, but if not, then let's move on to the um, interpretation of the MANOVA.